Hello, everyone. On behalf of everyone here at Janelia Research Campus and our sister institutes, I welcome you all to the November edition of Life Science Across the Globe. The topic for today's event is RNA therapeutics and is hosted by our sister institute at the John Curtis School of Medical Research at the Australian National University. A few notes from the organizers before we get started. Audience, we welcome your participation. So please feel free to send in your questions to the panelists uh, anytime during the talk or the discussion. You may do so by typing them in the Q&A box. We'd love to hear from you to see how we are doing. So please take a moment to fill in a brief survey that we would post at the end of the session. Do visit our website to learn more about the series and also to check out recordings from the past event. And everyone is invited to stay back for the Meet the Panelists session, which is an informal conversation with the panelists, uh, mainly around career development. And with that, I will now turn it over to Dr. Graham Mann from the John Curtis School of Medical Research at Australian National University for some opening remarks. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome uh, to, this, uh, to this seminar. Uh, we're delighted to have been invited to host uh, one of the Life Science Across the Globe seminars, and I'd like to thank very much our speakers and Howard Hughes Janelia uh, for supporting this event. If I could just uh, share my uh, opening slide. So we're coming to you uh, here in, in Canberra, uh, Australia, uh, from the beautiful campus of the Australian National University. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging that this is the land of First Nations people, uh, and we pay our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people uh, and their elders and any Indigenous people here present. So uh, Australian National University has a very proud uh, tradition of uh, discovery and translation science. Uh, the John Curtin School is the uh, Biomedical Research Institute of, uh, of the ANU. And uh, we've been proud to host uh, work that led to the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1996 from Peter Doherty and Rolf Sinkenagel. The John Curtin School of Medical Research uh, focuses on discovery and translation based around the complex biology that matters to human health. And really this breaks down into three key areas uh, in the genome, our immunology, our immune defenses, uh, and in brain and mind. And we aim to impact through that uh, on uh, the diseases that are of the genome, such as cancer, in immune and inflammatory and infectious diseases and uh, disorders of brain and mind. And we prioritize and we have special expertise in indigenous health. But one of our uh, primary foci uh, for, for many years has been in RNA biology uh, and motivated by many things, but uh, not least because of our leadership position in RNA science, we've brought together the more than $10 million a year of funded activity in RNA science into a new center, uh, the, R the uh, Shine Delgano Center for RNA Innovation. And with that, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce the leader of, of that centre, uh, a leader in RNA science, uh, Professor Thomas Price, uh, who will be the moderator of this seminar. So welcome, everybody. All right. Thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me and I uh, welcome you also to this uh, event. I'm going to be the moderator of this event today. Um, and it's a pleasure for me to introduce our first speaker, Ross Hannon who is the Deputy Dean of Research at our university's College of Health and Medicine, and also the Centenary Chair in Cancer Research at the John Curtin School of Medical Research. Uh, Ross uh, has a PhD from the University of Tasmania. Um, he then did postdoctoral research in the United States and returned to Australia in 2000, uh, rose through the ranks uh, as an academic in different places in Melbourne, and uh, as I said before, he's now a centenary chair of cancer research here at our university. Um, he's known for his multidisciplinary work on ribosome biogenesis, which has led to new treatment paradigms in cancer centered on drugs that activate nucleolar stress. So with that, I hand over to you, Ross. So uh, thanks for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here and to speak to everybody. Good morning or afternoon, wherever you are. And thank you so much to Janelia Research Campus and Howard Hughes for uh, allowing us to talk. I'm going to talk about targeting ribosomal RNA synthesis for the treatment of cancer. And just to remind you, 
that uh, we're doing this work in the Shane Delgado Centre for RNA Innovation, uh, and that's been a really important uh, a new initiative led by Thomas Price. So these are my disclosures. I uh, received funding from Pomerath Therapeutics, which is a company I helped start, and I'll talk a bit about that work today. So this is ribosome biogenesis, which I study, and ribosome biogenesis is probably one of the most complex processes a cell undergoes. Uh, it uses a considerable amount of the cellular energy and normally it can constitutes up to 60% of the total transcription in the cell. Um, growth factor signaling pathways or negative regulators of growth directly regulate RNA polymerase 1, which is the enzyme dedicated to the synthesis of this uh, large non-coding RNA, the 47S, uh, which gives rise to the 5.8S, 28S and 18S RNA. But you also require RNA polymerase 3 to generate the 5S and RNA polymerase 2 to generate the ribosomal proteins, which are then assembled into the large and small subunits in the nucleolus, which are then exported uh, for, for translation. Uh, I've got MIC up here just to remind you that MIC is one of the most potent regulators of this pathway, and we think it sensitizes cells to these drugs shown in red, which I'm going to talk about today, which directly inhibit the transcription and synthesis of this ribosomal RNA, and we've used that to treat cancer. So just to remind you about the RDNA repeats, they're unique in the fact that you have up to 400 copies of these ranged in a head-to-tail fashion. Uh, this is just a blow-up schematic of one of those RDNA units. It has a promoter like a POL2 gene, an enhancer, and then the 18, 5.8S and 28S. And this is tr transcribed exclusively by RNA polymerase 1. These are found on the acrocentric uh, chromosomes, and they, uh, through phase condensation, they coalesce of the different uh, the five different chromosomes coalesce into these nucleoli, and that's better shown in this diagram here. The blue is just DAPI staining; this is a nucleus. The red is RNA fish to, to demonstrate the RDNA transcription. It's probably worth reminding people that the nucleoli have been. Uh, evolved to undergo many other processes in addition to ribosome biogenesis. And indeed, there's up to 4,000 different proteins in nucleolus, and only 30% of them evolved in ribosome biogenesis. But I won't have time to talk about those other functions today. Um, RNA synthesis is upregulated during malignant transformation. This is a model of a MYC-driven lymphoma, where uh, MYC is driven by the EU <coughs> enhancer. These mice within 20 weeks get a significant uh, disease. As shown here, if you look at the uh, pro-pre-B pro, uh, pro cells, massive accumulation of these uh, malignant cells. And this correlates with a significant increase in RDNA transcription of wild type, pre-malignant, malignant. This is pre-RNA expression on the side there. This is a massive increase, probably 95% of all the RNA in these cells are ribosomal. And this is RNA fish going from wild type, pre-malignant to malignant, and you can see significant increase in ribosomal RNA. So it's significantly upregulated in, in cancer. This is the reason why we thought it might be a good target. Um, this just shows, excuse me, if you do a pole one chip uh, for bile type pre malignant and malignant across the transcribed region, you see a significant increase in ribosomal RNA, and that's what's driving this increased transcription. So the question is then, what happens if you inhibit RNA synthesis? Do you just get less ribosomes? Well, it turns out that actually during evolution, uh, the nucleolus has evolved. Uh, mechanisms to sense fidelity of the ribosomal biogenesis pathway. And when this pathway, because it's so important, is dysregulated, it activates these checkpoints. There's many of these checkpoints. I'm not going to go through all of them, but the, the basic premise is that you disrupt ribosomal biogenesis, which leads to disassembly of the nucleoli. This allows ribosomal proteins that were normally incorporating into the ribosome to go about, to come out of the nucleolus and have many other functions. For example, activating the expression of P21, turning off MIC through various mechanisms, turning off E2F. Probably the most predominant one is this one here, which is the regulation of the tumor suppressor P53. Two ribosomal proteins, L5 and L11, bind the ubiquitin ligase MDM2, therefore preventing it from degrading P53. You get accumulation of P53 and growth inhibition apoptosis or senescence. And that's just shown more clearly here. This is a Western block for P53. At the top here, you can see when we add actinomycin D at low doses, which inhibits pole one transcription selectively, you get a massive upregulation of P53. 
And if you take out L5 or L11 by knocking them down, you can actually completely block that activation, showing it's dependent on L5 or L11. We can do a similar experiment where we take a version of MDM2 knocked in, which has a mutation which prevents L5 and L11 binding. Once again, that completely blocks the activation of P53. Showing this pathway, <clears throat> accumulation of uh, this P53 is, is completely dependent on this nuclear surveillance pathway. Now, what's interesting is that, that it's not just ribosome biogenesis uh, uh, and inhibition of whole one transcription directly that causes this pathway. Here we've done a high throughput screen, and this is P53 intensity shown on the bottom. If we knock down a whole bunch of genes in the genome or ribosomal protein to activate P53, and if you knock down L5 or L11, you block that. So almost any gene in the genome that you knock down uh, requires a nuclear surveillance pathway, and it's not just uh, genotoxic things. If you take various treatments, such as actinomycin D, alpha-amanitin, a topazide, a 5-fluorouridine, a UV treatment, um, irradiation, all of them require a, a, in, an intact nuclear surveillance pathway to stabilize P53, suggesting that this is a primordial and probably one of the most important pathways for regulating P53. So we've tried to harness this to actually test whether we could actually use this to develop drugs. And this is just mainly for the, some of the graduate students that might be listening. This is sort of the pathway we took did high throughput screens of a, of a compound library of 100,000 compounds looking for things which inhibited pole one transcription. We did a counter screen to make sure that they didn't inhibit a pole two gene. We went through various uh, PK oral cassettes, secondary screens, primary development, and this is the pathway I won't go through it in detail. And this just shows you the sort of money that we had to generate to get through these different pathways. And here shown here is actually the, the sequence, the timing of this, and it's sort of important for graduate students who are developing drugs. You can see the sort of time it took. Began screening in 2008, lead drug 2010, our first paper 2011, so that was like, you know, three years later. First funding four years after we started. And probably the breakthrough paper was this Biowater Adele Cancer Cell paper, which led to funding for a clinical trial. This clinical trial has now been completed. This drug inhibits uh, the initiation of pole one transcription, and this is a tattoo of the actual CX5461 on one of my very enthusiastic students. We recommend all students get a tattoo while they're doing their PhD. And we've published many, many papers on this, so I'm not gonna go through it in detail. Uh, they can be found online. This is just one example from the paper. This is the emu MIC model again, where we adoptively transfer the, the MIC driven lymphoma cells into mice, and they get diseased very rapidly within eight days. This is the tumor cells here, shown in green because the fluorescent tag. Here's the tumor cells shown here. If we treat the vehicle, it has no effect. If we get a single dose of CX5 or 6 one we completely eradicate the tumor cells, and importantly, the normal cells come back. So this shows, very surprisingly, that you can actually target a, 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 one of the most basic housekeeping processes in the cell, the synthesis of the non-coding ribosomal RNA, and get, like, get selectivity to killing tumor cells. And this was totally unexpected at the time. This leads to nucleolar disassembly, as I suggested, and a rapid activation of P53 within one hour, and apoptosis starting, this is caspase 3 cleavage, within three hours. So this is a rapid response. These cells are dying rapidly. It's not a slow response to the loss of ribosomes. So we've tried to use this to see what sort of models we could treat in cancer. This also leads to a significant increase in survival of these uh, mice. Uh, they eventually relapse through acquired mutations which bypass this process. So this drug now has moved to phase one trial, which we've completed, um, which we've published in Cancer Discovery. It's gone on to a couple of phase two trials and now has been fast-tracked for therapeutic um, treatment of patients with breast ovarian cancers with BRCA mutation. Now, one of the problems with this drug, as I noticed early on, is that in addition to inhibiting POL1, it caused DNA damage around the nucleus. This is CX compared to topicide. The red is that gamma H2X is a marker of DNA damage. And it turns out this drug is actually has activity to inhibit uh, TOPO2-alpha in addition to POL1. And it turns out that TOPO2-alpha is part of the initiation complex. So this DNA damage was just occurring around the, nu the nucleus where the POL1 transcription takes place. And it was probably the reason for the limiting toxicity due to photosensitivity in the trial. Because of that, although this is a useful drug, uh, we set out to develop uh, second-generation pole one inhibitors, which were cleaner and with let, had no effect on DNA damage. And that drug, which we developed, is PMR116, developed by Nadine Hine and Kate Hannon, 
in the laboratory and it has significant advantages over the first generation inhibitor, uh, particularly it penetrates the blood-brain barrier. We want to use this for brain cancers. And a lot of this work was done at the ANU Center for Therapeutic Discovery in the John Curtin School of Medical Research. So this drug inhibits POL1 transcription. Where is it inhibited? Well, this is a chip assay showing polymerase across the RNA gene and vehicle with PMR116. We don't decrease polymerase at the promoter and the enhancer, but we do across the gene suggesting it's blocking promoter escape. It has about a, a, a thousand fold increase in sensitivity compared to for POL1 compared to POL2. So it's selective and it selectively kills tumor cells compared to normal, to, to normal cells. So we think this is a good drug to take forward in our treatments. Most importantly, it doesn't induce DNA damage. This is a vehicle, whoops, sorry, this is a vehicle treatment of, let's go backwards, vehicle treatment of cells, the, sorry. Vehicle treatment of cells on the left, a PMR, and then CX5461, green is DNA damage marked by gamma H2X. And you can see significant DNA damage with CX561, but none with PMR116. Similarly shown here in the Western blocks on the bottom, both drugs activate P53, but only CX5461 activates check one and check two, which are marked as a DNA damage pathway. So we're quite confident that this drug doesn't activate DNA damage. It is a clean pol one inhibitor. So it treats mice with lymphoma. This is the same model I showed you before, the immunic lymphoma with a significant increase in survival. We spent quite a bit of time on other models, uh, hem hematological models, and this is a model of AML. This is an incurable disease in humans. Um, this is driven through a mixed lineage leukemia fusion proteins. These mice also bear activated RAS because about 20% of these mixed lineage leukemia um, cancers have activated RAS. We can also monitor the cells through GFB and luciferase. This is a, a, an adoptive transfer of these cells into the mice, which, which come down with leukemia. As can be shown here on the right, this is three different doses of the drug. You can see a significant increase in survival, which is better shown here on the bottom left, where survival versus days post-transplant. If you look at the standard therapies for patients, Cytarabine doxorubicin, they only get about 20, 22 days uh, increase in survival. So this increase in survival is significant, and we have high hopes for this drug for treatment in AML. We've tried, tried this out a number of different tumor models. This is a colorectal cancer syngenaic uh, model, um, and we can show that PMR116 is superior to irinotecan, shown here in the survival, red is CX, uh, PMR116, where this is the standard drug used for patients, you know, TCAN, and you can actually follow individual tumor volume here on the left, the red is the PMR116, and blue is the RNA TCAN. One of the other models we've spent quite a bit of time with, there's different models of uh, pedicillin cancer, and this is a DEN-induced, you know, chemically-induced model. And we see significant reduction in this massive increase in tumors in this model with the treatment of PMR116. Better shown in this graph here, we can see this robust decrease in both the numbers of tumors within these livers. And so we're following this up for various other models of liver cancer. Um, probably, and this is a collaboration with Luke Furick from the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre and some of other people such as Gary Risbridger. We're lucky to get access to a war autopsy of patients. Uh, unfortunately, patients have sort of died, but we've managed to get access to their tissue within a couple of hours of death so we can get tissue from places we wouldn't normally be able to get it from, such as bone uh, or, or the brain or the lung. In this case, we've got a xenograph uh, from the uh, uh, mice, this is a uh, metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer, which is lethal in men. And we can see here that uh, 300 milligrams of PMR116 treatment, not only does it block the growth, but actually gets rid of all the tumor cells. So this is a, a fantastic response given this poor unfortunate patient died of this disease. Not all of them respond as well. This is a, another prostate cancer that's metastasized to the dura, but even then we see a significant uh, decrease in uh, tumor size. So we're very hopeful for this in the phase two part of the second part of the phase one trial, we're hoping to test this on uh, prostate cancer patients. So where are we up to with this drug? Well, we've got FDA investigational new drug, drug status granted. 
We've opened a multi-center uh, first in human uh, study with this at the Pigma Callum Cancer Center and other places around Australia. The first part is a dose escalation phase shown on the left. And then the second part, which we're up to at the moment, will be an expansion phase where we'll be testing those patients which we think will best respond. In this case, we're confident that patients with MYC aberrations uh, will respond best because we know that MYC drives RDNA transcription. And just finally, how else will we, might we, um, in the last couple of minutes I've got, how else might we stratify patients? So it turns out that there's uh, mutations in chromatin uh, modifiers and actually histones themselves, H3.3, ATRX and DAX. So ATRX complexes with DAX to deposit H3.3 to form this heterochromatic structure. And it's very important for the stability of repetitive DNA, such as telomeric regions and also the ribosomal genes. Now, these mutations are found in a range of cancers. We're particularly interested in brain cancers because there's been no increased uh, treatments or improvement in survival in brain cancer patients for the last 30 years. Now, it turns out that if you have these mutations in ATRX, um, or you actually, sorry, you actually end up losing half your RDNA repeats. So it's, they're really important for RDNA repeat stability. Now, this loss of the RDNA repeats shown on the right-hand side leads to a significant increase in sensitivity of the drug to uh, CX PMR116, suggesting that patients with these mutations may be may respond very well. And we're going to use this as a strategy to select patients in, in phase two trials, particularly brain cancer. So I'm just going to summarize then. I've shown you that targeting pol one transcription is a promising approach to treat cancer. And the first and generation drugs are in phase one and phase two clinical trials in Australia and overseas. This therapy effect is mediated by checkpoint activation and also differentiation that I didn't have time to show. And then this, I just want to re-emphasize, this is not a slow response to the loss of ribosomes. It's a rapid activation of these checkpoints. And we believe this nuclear surveillance pathway that's been activated as a primordial sensor for cellular stress, something like akin to the canary in the coal mine. Almost all cellular stresses that stabilize P53 require this functional nuclear surveillance pathway. And that's quite surprising to us. So with that, I'll finish. Uh, this is the people who have done the work, Kate Haddon, the Dean Hine, Rita Ferreira, Amy George, and Polita Poe from my lab, and Tajani Udama, Udamana. Um, this is also a collaboration with Professor Luke Furek from the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre. With that, I'll leave you this last slide and I'll finish. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, um, Ross. Uh, we're looking like we're staying well in time, and I will therefore swiftly move on and introduce Melissa Moore as our next speaker. Melissa Moore is the Chief Scientific Officer Emeritus of Moderna. Uh, she did her PhD at the MIT and then started to focus on RNA biology at the MIT, working with Nobel laureate Phil Sharp. She had a stellar career as an HHMI investigator in academic RNA research, um, received many awards for this. Among them, for example, she was made a member of the National Academy of Science. But from, and relevant particularly to today, from 2016 onwards, she led the early stage research teams at Moderna to develop their platform technologies in mRNA design and delivery. So thanks, Melissa, for joining us. Uh, thank you, Thomas. And uh, again, thank you for uh, inviting me. I'm really happy to be here to share some uh, some of our research on mRNA medicines with you. So I also, I, I um, as you know, have left academics and work full time for a company. So I have to show you this disclaimer. Um, I think you've had enough time to look at that now, so move on. So um, the kinds of molecules that Ross was telling us about are were small molecule medicines, and small molecule medicines really have evolved over the just less than a hundred years. And here I'm showing penicillin, prontosil, penicillin and prontosil, which were the first antibiotics discovered. And then of course we have uh, many other uh, small molecule medicines that we take every day. Now, the vast majority of these small molecule medicines um, interact with proteins, so they target proteins. They modulate the activity of proteins, just as Ross was telling us. 
Um, but another class of medicines that has emerged in recent years is proteins themselves. So, and these are often called biologics. And the first biologic that was discovered was uh, insulin, which was discovered in 1921 at the University of Toronto. Um, but over time, we uh, many, many more proteins themselves have been used as medicines. And so just to illustrate this fact, uh, last earlier this year, no, it was last year, Nature published a um, uh, article saying that the FD, American FDA had approved the hundredth uh, monoclonal antibody as a medicine. And so they, monoclonal antibodies and specifically have become really important uh, medicines to fight disease. Now on the right-hand side of the slide, uh, this is an image from that same paper, it shows the number of uh, new antibodies entering the clinic every year. So this is not cumulative. This means that in 2020, there were 160 monoclonal antibodies that entered the clinic in that year. So that just shows you uh, how um, important these have become. Now, the uh, as much as, as um, biologics and proteins uh, made outside the body and then injected into the body are, um, have been proven themselves as effective medicines. They do have certain a number of limitations. So one of the limitations is that they require very large, dedicated industrial infrastructures. Uh, so this is a a typical this is a cartoon of a typical bioreactor for uh, a biologic where you're growing uh, you know large large uh, quantities of Chinese hamster ovary cells or other tissue culture cells to make the protein, and then the proteins need to be purified from that. Um, another issue with biologics is that each one is unique. So once the protein is made and even different monoclonal antibodies, once they've been made, uh, you have to figure out how to formulate them, what their um, PKPD properties are, how to stabilize them. And so that can take uh, some time. And um, a third limitation is that, of course, the most proteins, especially secreted proteins, are post-translationally modified. And the post-translational modifications that are put on uh, are different between different uh, organisms. And so even though the Chinese hamster ovary cells that we use to make uh, monoclonal antibodies are very similar in their glycosylation patterns to humans, they're not exactly the same. Um, and then finally, the uh, pro a, a problem with biologics is they're really limited to proteins that can be delivered extracellularly. They have to be injected into the bloodstream or into the interstitial fluid. And so, and most of them cannot enter cells. So um, that really limits them to uh, just a portion of uh, proteins in the human proteome uh, that are secreted proteins. Um, but over 90% of the human proteome is either intracellular or uh, transmembrane proteins. And so um, the biologics in general cannot, we cannot use uh, those proteins as medicines if we make them outside of the body. So the simple idea of mRNA medicines is that instead of uh, supplying the body with uh, pre-made protein is to supply it with the mRNA instructions instead so that then this can, the, the human body itself can make its own medicinal proteins. Um, and it's, you know, it really is, is, is simple, uh, but as I'll show you, it's taken us uh, over 60 years to figure out exactly how to do this. Um, but one of the, the features of uh, both proteins and messenger RNAs uh, that is really important and, and uh, very similar to classic uh, medicines is that they're temporary. They are not um, you know, ch permanent changes in the uh, DNA or genome. So to illustrate this, I like to use the example of the circadian clock. So of course your circadian clock is driven by uh, circadian uh, clock proteins. And I'm just uh, showing you a generic uh, example here where the clock protein uh, appears and disappears with remarkable regularity every 24 hours. And that's driven by uh, the appearance and disappearance of the clock mRNA. And so uh, what this means is that, you know, every day you're getting your daily dose of clock messenger RNAs and your daily dose of clock uh, proteins. So um, mRNAs uh, and, and proteins too, but mRNAs have uh, all three attributes of classic medicines. That is that they have limited duration of effect, 
They uh, have predictable dose dependent effects. The amount of protein that is made is directly dependent on the amount of mRNA that is there. And then uh, they clearly can be redosable. So if we could unlock the possibility of using mRNA as medicines um, and, and make that into a platform technology, then we would actually be able to meet many unmet medical needs. Um, and as I'll show you in a bit, it, it also will, ex it can accelerate, greatly accelerate the uh, research and development uh, pipelines. Uh, Ross noted in his talk that it's taken over 10 years to get through a, a, from, from a discovery to a phase one trial. Uh, and that is pretty typical, the typical, um, time for development of a new small molecule medicine is, is 12 years, and the typical cost is $2.5 billion. So it really is quite expensive when you get through uh, everything. Um, now, why is it, if this idea is so simple, why has it taken us so long? Why is it only now that we are able to make mRNA medicines? And it really has been a, a, a long road. It required and I, I cannot stress enough um, the importance of foundational uh, uh, curiosity-based research because one cannot figure out how to engineer a system or utilize um, the system to, to, make, to make medicines until you understand the basic principles of how the biology works. And here I'm, I'm showing you a timeline that uh, is from a paper uh, from the BioNTech folks um, who who uh, show the timeline of, of important discoveries that led to mRNA medicines. And I do want to give a shout out to uh, some researchers from Australia, uh, Suzanne Corey and Jerry Adams at, in Melbourne, and then Gerald Booth, who was a longtime uh, faculty member in Sydney, who uh, were made very important contributions to the discovery of the mRNA cap structure. Um, and so there have been uh, many, many uh, academicians all over the world who have worked since 1961, so mRNA was discovered in 1961, uh, to really just understand the structure of messenger RNA, the uh, how it is synthesized in the body, how it is uh, translated and, and utilized in the body. And so uh, I, we would not have, be able to do what we do today without all of that foundational knowledge uh, that that accumulated over time, and I'm I'm a as a previous academic myself, I'm a very big proponent on uh, continuing uh, to fund basic academic research because uh, it will be crucial for our ability to make uh, new new medicines in the future. Now, uh, having that said, let me show you the path to make an mRNA medicine today. So today, this is the entire path in uh, one slide of making an mRNA medicine. Uh, it starts with an idea for a new therapeutic protein. That, of course, then uh, dictates the amino acid sequence. Um, at Moderna, we've developed very sophisticated computational algorithms to, to back translate that into an mRNA sequence. Now, that might seem like a simple thing, but uh, because of the redundancy of the genetic code, the um, there are many, many mRNA sequences. And when I say many, many, I'm talking big numbers. So a slide that I didn't bring today, but um, if you do the math for spike vax, uh, for, for mRNA 1273, which encoded the, uh, MR, the protein, uh, spike protein for SARS-CoV-2, um, there are actually 10 to the 632 possible mRNA sequences that could encode spike vax because of the, uh, the redundancy of the genetic code. And yet we were we were able to make just one, and it worked. So um, we did that because we've put in many years of uh, figuring out how to how to make an mRNA that will make uh, good amounts of protein. Um, that this then once we've decided on the mRNA sequence, uh, we send this off to our manufacturing plant in Norwood, Massachusetts, where they make a DNA template. They make that in the form of a plasmid that they grow up in bacteria and then uh, purify and cut with a restriction enzyme. So we're gonna do runoff transcription. Um, and then we add the nucleotides, the polymerase, the capping enzymes, buffers, uh, make lots of copies of the RNA, purify it, 
formulate that RNA with lipids to make lipid nanoparticles, and then it can be put in the vial uh, quality controlled, which is crucial and crucially important for clinical grade material. And then it's ready to, to go into the patient where now the patient's own cells can make that same therapeutic protein that we uh, thought about back here. Now, uh, in comparison to uh, biologics, where I showed you that same person on this scale standing next to that huge bioreactor, this is the size of the clinical manufacturing equipment that we use to make mRNA medicines. And this particular uh, one, which is no bigger than a, than a large, like minus 80 freezer, um, you know, we can make a million doses of vaccines uh, on something this, this small. So um, the... Another advantage of mRNA medicines is that once you figure out how to make a particular thing like a vaccine and how to deliver it to, let's say, the uh, the the resident monocytes in your your muscle, um, and then if you want to make a new vaccine, it's easy because you just swap out the sequence of the mRNA. You're not changing the PKPD properties of the medicine. So all of the medicines within a particular modality, for example, vaccines, can be um, use the same raw materials and the same manufacturing processes, which involve no mammalian cell culture at all. It's all enzyme based. Um, and our, our, the manufacturing equipment is actually these big empty ballrooms that where we can wheel in and out different pieces of equipment very easily. So we can rapidly adapt the manufacturing to make uh, many different products uh, and not just have a dedicated uh, machinery. So uh, in when it came to making mRNA 1273, our vaccine for SARS-CoV-2, this is how fast we could move. Um, within, it took us a two days after the sequence uh, was posted online in January, uh, January 11th, 2020, to agree with our uh, collaborators at NIH of exactly which version of the spike protein to make. And then it took us one hour to design that mRNA. Then we were able to make the mRNA, get all, do all of the quality control testing and get it formulated and ready in 45 days. So uh, it really has incredibly shortened the, the timeline. Um, and if you got the Moderna vaccine, that mRNA that we designed in one hour is the one that went in your arm. So uh, it's, uh, it worked the first time. It's amazing. Um, now, one of the things I wanted to just talk about is that, uh, all of the different possibilities of using mRNA, cause it's just, it's amazing the, the kinds of things you can do. So for example, for that vaccine, the, uh, we only used one messenger RNA because we needed to just make one protein. That protein makes a trimer, but it's just one, uh, subunit. For other vaccines, um, for example, for our cytomegalovirus vaccine, the uh, important epitope is a multi-protein complex of five proteins. And so the way that we do that is simply to put in five different mRNAs plus a sixth mRNA because we want to target um, cytomegalovirus in order to have good immun immunogenicity for that. You have to um, target both the fibroblast and epithelial cells. Um, so we are, this vaccine has six different mRNAs in it, and five of them make a multi-protein complex. And so your body, your cells, just assemble that complex the way they would if the virus had infected you. And it makes it much easier to, to make new uh, vaccines. Another thing that we can do and that we're working on hard is to, uh, you can multiplex our mRNA vaccines very easily. So um, here, one of the things that we're working on is a, an adult pen respiratory vaccine where it would be an, a yearly annual booster for COVID, flu, and respiratory syncytial virus, which are all very uh, important, uh, um, give a lot of uh, morbidity and mortality, particularly in the, the elderly populations. So uh, we're, we're working on, on that. Um, another use of mRNA is that we can make personalized cancer vaccines. So here what we're doing is taking a sample of a patient's tumor and uh, a sample of their blood and doing deep sequencing of both to find all the mutations that are present in the tumor that are not present in the blood. And then we can use bioinformatics analysis to predict which of those mutations would be expressed in proteins in the tumor or in the cancer 
that are not expressed in normal tissue. Uh, and then we can, uh, based on their um, specific uh, HLA type, um, we can we can predict which of those peptides, those neoantigens would be uh, presented on the surface of the cancer cells. And so we make an mRNA that encodes up to 34 of those neoantigens and give that back to them as a vaccine. And we're doing this in collaboration with Merck, but our goal is to provide the vaccine back to them within 45 days. And so you'll notice that 45 day window, um, that's the same window that it took us to make um, mRNA 1273. So we can we can really make we can make um, medicines for million hundreds of millions of people, or we can make medicines for just one person for from mRNA. Um, finally, I just wanted to point out that here's the metabolic chart of the human body, and about one in thousand newborn, one in a thousand newborns are born without the the ability to make one of the enzymes that's on this uh, chart, and so these metabolic error, these metabolic uh, rare diseases, right now um, have almost no therapies. They're they're managed by managing their symptoms. But um, they they don't we don't have the ability yet to give them back the ability to make the missing protein. So one of the um, the uh, medicines that we're working on is uh, directed toward uh, propionic acidemia, and this is a, a rare disease that affects between one hundred one and twenty thousand and one hundred two hundred fifty thousand individuals um, that lack the uh, enzyme uh, that. Um, um, make the so propanyl CoA uh, enzyme, and so the enzyme that 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 um, uh, metabolizes propanyl CoA, uh, and this enzyme is a multi subunit enzyme. And so what we do is we have developed uh, therapies where we now we can target the liver and deliver those messenger RNAs directly to the liver where the liver makes the in, the liver cells make the sub, the individual subunits this is a protein that is actually in the mitochondria so it can be imported directly into the mitochondria and i just wanted to give you a, uh, in this last couple of slides a little teaser um, we've actually now been dosing uh, patients uh, we've dosed 10 different patients with this for over a year um, and we have very good uh, safety uh, that that and none of the um, patients have uh, gone off of the trial, so uh, they they it's it seems to be working, and we've been redosing them every couple of weeks with this mRNA. And so, uh, just as a, a little bit of data, because I know I didn't show you any data in the talk, um, this what this shows is each one of the lines on this um, this chart is a patient, so patients one through nine. And these patients tend to have metabolic decompensations. So they'll often end up in the emergency room because they uh, just could not um, manage their disorder using their diet. Uh, so if they get, and also if they get a cold or something, they often end up in the emergency room. And so these red dots are uh, in the year previous to them starting to take the mRNA medicines. This is how many metabolic decompensations they had. And so then this is the number that they had um, with in the year following uh, starting taking the medicine. And you can see that, you know, there's one patient here that is, it's not working for everybody, but it really is um, being very helpful for these patients already. And this is, was our just initial cohort. So this is, we're doing uh, dose escalation. And so we, um, are now escalating the doses to get to figure out what is the best therapeutic dose for, for each patient. So I'm very heartened by these data because uh, I not only can mRNAs be used to make uh, vaccines for many different unmet needs, but now we can really uh, treat patients and give them back the ability to make enzymes, to, to make enzymes that they're missing. So I just want to close by saying uh, that Moderna has been an amazing place to work. Uh, we've been around for now since 2010. Uh, this was a picture of the company in about 2018. We were about 600 people at that time. At the time that COVID hit, we were 850 people. This is a picture from September uh, this year. We're now over 5,000 people. Um, and we are, uh, none of what we do is the work of one person. It really is, takes an incredible 
uh, team to uh, get all of this done. And I just really want to thank my colleagues at Moderna. It's been an amazing journey. And I want to thank you for um, listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melissa. <clears throat> um, by sheer coincidence, I actually was visiting Moderna when this photo in 2018 was taken. So <laughs> I, I didn't manage to photobomb it, but I was in the same hall just behind a pillar. <laughs> well, sadly, I forgot to go down. So I was upstairs and I was, I'm was i not in that photo. So. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, moving swiftly on, I uh, have the pleasure of introducing our third speaker, Catherine Mills. Catherine is professor and director of the Monash University Bioethics Center. Uh, she holds a PhD in philosophy from the ANU, our university here. And uh, she rose through the academic ranks at universities in Sydney before moving to Monash University. And Catherine's main research interests lie in the areas of biopolitics and bioethics, especially in relation to technologies of reproduction. So, Thank you, Catherine, for joining us. Thank you, Thomas, for that introduction. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here today and um, very honored actually to be presenting alongside um, my co-panelists, just getting my screen organized. Um, so I'm going to begin today by talking about how lucky I am or acknowledging how lucky I am. I'm lucky to live in a country that has a relatively good healthcare system. I'm lucky that unlike millions of people around the world, none of my family have died from COVID. I'm also lucky that I've been able to get four vaccinations against COVID, all free, I might add. At least one of these was a Moderna spike fax, so thank you, Melissa. We all know that COVID vaccina that vaccination status makes a huge difference to the likelihood of severe, serious or fatal COVID infection. Yet there's still many countries in which rates of, of vaccination are low or where a large percentage of people are only partly vaccinated. This, of course, is not simply a technological problem. It's a problem of social, political and economic structures and ways of doing things. So my task today is to pan out and look at how RNA therapeutics fit within or potentially transform these structures and some of the ethical issues that arise from doing so. So in order to do that, what I'm going to do is start by comparing or talking a little bit about the difference between RNA and DNA uh, therapeutics, and then talk more about the disruption and ways of thinking about responsible innovation in relation to RNA therapeutics, and particularly touching on these two issues of equity and the contrast between public and personalized medicine. Now, as Thomas said in his introduction or indicated, this is not really my full area of expertise. So the first thing I did when I started putting together this paper was to go to my favorite database uh, for ethics research and look at what has already been said about RNA therapeutics. As it turns out, you can see there's 118 papers in this database on gene editing and ethics. In terms of RNA therapeutics and ethics, there was none. So that wasn't very helpful, but it was somewhat instructive. So I then went on to have to do a little bit more research of my own, comparing DNA uh, therapeutics to RNA therapeutics. And it struck me that there's some really interesting contrasts here that Melissa was already beginning to indicate as well. So one of the really key differences is the question, is the difference between permanence and transience? So this has really significant implications for thinking about things like safety and, and efficacy. So in terms of safety, you have a much uh, reduced risk of off-target effects with RNA. You also have no, you know, there's a kind of significantly reduced risks of ongoing uh, harmful effects, which is uh, for, for DNA editing um, or therapeutics is really quite a significant concern, especially when we're talking in terms of um, inheritable genetic modification, uh, which then has, has risk for generations uh, henceforth. So that's, that's not going to be a concern for RNA. So in terms of safety, we know that gene editing has a, a, has a patchy uh, safety record. Um, we don't yet know whether human uh, 
inheritable genome editing is safe or not, um, but we know that RNA checks are going to be safer um, uh, and we've seen good evidence of that so far. In terms of efficacy, well, we don't yet know whether gene editing will be efficacious. We know that RNA therapies are or can be. We also know that RNA therapies are much more uh, usable insofar as they entail much more mobile manufacturing processes and so on that Melissa was already indicating. So there seems to be some really significant advantages to RNA as opposed to DNA-based therapies. But at the same time, there's still some really interesting social and ethical issues. And I think it's at this interface of how technologies are brought into existing and uh, existing social structures and how they change those social structures that actually make a huge difference to how we can actually really harness the benefits of these technologies. So what I think we need to begin by recognizing is that RNA therapeutics are really quite disruptive for our current medical system. Um, we need to recognize that they're part of a broader trend toward the integration of scientific development and entrepreneurialism. entrepreneurialism. Now, they're not unique in this way. This has been happening on a large scale. It's part of a general process after the Human Genome Project of monetizing and making valuable biological materials. As Melissa says, it's making your body treat yourself. So you can see it in a sense as enhancing the biological and economic value of specific molecular processes. So it's also not unique in, that, in the kind of integration of science and entrepreneurialism. And I do want to emphasize that this is not bad in itself. And in fact, it may be a good thing insofar as it leads to more breakthroughs, more scalable health solutions that, than might be achieved with publicly funded science. However, this integration of science and startups gets particularly interesting, I think, when we're talking about innovation in therapeutics because then we get into really core questions of how we distribute the social good of health. So we get questions like who gets access, who pays, and really, ultimately, what do we owe others when it comes to health? So one framework for thinking about these questions has been through what's called responsible innovation. And this is a way of thinking about the intersection of therapeutics with and how they kind of come into conjunction with, with social values more broadly, especially in relation to health policy. So it's a way of integrating health policy and innovation policy. So when we look at it through that framework, the key question then, I think, becomes what does responsible innovation look like for RNA therapeutics? Now, I'm not going to actually answer that question here, but I'm going to sketch out a couple of things that we might take notice of in trying to address that question. The first one of these is a question of equity. So we all know the best known success story of RNA therapeutics, and that's the development of the COVID vaccine. But impressive as that technology is, which it is in many ways, um, it's still only half the solution. The rest of the solution is getting it to people around the world. And that's where we run into familiar problems of global inequality. So pointing out this is not a critique of the technology, but it's just to say we have to recognize the way that new technologies intersect with, it, with existing structures. And in doing so, actually meet really practical uh, challenges. So there are, for instance, practical challenges in delivering vaccines that require freezing temperatures for stability to countries where the cold chain is, it, is already inadequate for standard food storage and transportation purposes. This is not a problem with the technology per se, but the way it interacts with social structures. So we can see then that there's a lot still to be done in terms of how we actually implement and utilize these amazing technologies. So the OECD, for instance, has really kind of 
developed a strong policy response that suggests that we need to be doing a lot more in terms of really developing that global coverage um, of, 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 of vaccination for COVID for the pandemic to get anywhere near being over. So the thing that I really want to point to though, and what's really interesting to me about RNA therapeutics is this, um, the contrast that we get between the widespread public health implementation in COVID vaccination, and at the same time, the really targeted personalized medicine that can be developed through, for instance, things like um, very, very individualized cancer vaccinations um, and treatments for rare genetic diseases. So we get this really interesting um, mix of being able to treat common diseases at a really broad scale uh, in public health measures. And on the, at the same time, the development of very, very individualized person, what we might call personalized medicine uh, treatments. And I find this really, really fascinating because it brings out something that is a really core value in thinking about health equity and access. And this is a question about how we think about um, the equality of people across the board. And in this, we can think about or, or look at uh, in-country COVID vaccination distribution. And we can see this in a way as really an example of um, egalitarianism at its best. So to think about COVID vaccination in terms of egalitarianism, we can see, for instance, that for this, everyone, regardless of their social situation, had access to COVID vaccinations, at least in theory. So thinking about a country like Australia in particular. So COVID vaccination was made, was made available freely to everyone. There were certainly practical challenges in actually getting it to people. So for instance, there was still inequities in access because of practical issues such as distribution to remote communities, which significantly affected First Nation communities in Australia in particular. But we can also see that there's a way in which the very fact that some people were given early access, those who were at, at higher risk, for instance, got to go first, that is itself a kind of principle of egalitarianism, that you make the worst off better before you uh, address everyone. There's also something very equalising about the fact that with the COVID vaccination, we all got the same dose, right? So it was a one-size-fits-all in a sense. Um, it, 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 Fair, fair enough. Um, but there wasn't, it wasn't kind of personalised in any particular way. In a way, people became fungible. Um, we, it, it didn't matter who you were, you got the same dose. That's entirely different for personalised medicine approaches. So with individualised RNA therapeutics, for instance, we see um, so here I'm thinking about treatments for very ultra rare diseases, um, certain vaccinations for cancers and so on. These kinds of personalized treatments really challenge that egalitarian model of health resource allocation or health access allocation. So from a resource perspective, personalized medicine can pit individual well-being against broader social health. It raises questions about who pays who has access and how do we balance that unmet patient need against broader uh, public health concerns? So I think in thinking about the kind of personalized approaches that are being developed in RNA therapeutics, we can actually learn something from the established debates around orphan drugs um, that has been going on for some time. So in this debate, what we see is a real contrast between the costs of research and development, as has been pointed out, um, and the concern about marketability. So companies developing these drugs are just never going to get their money back because it just costs so much to actually develop them in the first place. And you might be then marketing them to very, very small numbers of patients. But at the same time, there might be quite significant unmet patient need in, in that these are severe diseases. They actually have a large impact on uh, public health systems and so on. So you've got to find some balance between those two things. 
Now, it's possible that RNA therapeutics will actually move us beyond that particular stalemate of orphan drugs. So it may be that we end up, and I hope that we can kind of get to this position, where RNA therapeutics can be both personalising and equalising for health. So here I want to uh, point to some really interesting work um, being done by uh, John Yu and the N equals one collaborative, uh, which is really focused on developing these personalised approaches to ultra rare uh, genetic diseases, but also thinking about how to equalise um, those, those therapeutics. And John, John Yu has some interesting predictions around what will happen, and in particular, thinking about the cost of new drug approvals. So he points out uh, that drugs currently uh, cost about 2.6 billion uh, to get approval and takes a number of years. Um, the question is, well, what or how can we get the cost of drugs down to a point where it actually equalizes medicine? And he contrasts this with, um, with uh, genomic sequencing and the way in which that has kind of come down significantly since the Human Genome Project. So, you know, as you will know, the Human Genome Project initially took about 2.7 billion to run the first, uh, uh, develop the first sequence. And now you can actually get genome sequencing for about $1,000. Still not necessarily uh, accessible by everyone, but certainly much better than it was. So can we get to that point with ultra rare disease treatments? That's the kind of question that we need to be thinking about. But if we can get to there, it's going to require whole system transformations. So there's going to be a need for things like um, much more rigor, uh, much more extensive data sharing and open development of drugs, changes to regulatory frameworks and clinical trial designs, the kind of built-in standardization of genomics uh, to all medical care, but also the changes in the manufacturing and delivery processes. And then right at the end, changes to how patients themselves interact with technologies and therapeutics. So there will be changes in how we have to deliver information to patients, what kind of consent is required and how that care is delivered right at the end. So I think, at, when we look at that kind of whole system transformation that has to happen, it seems to me that there's an enormous number of really significant ethical questions that still have to be addressed to think about how we can fully harness the benefits of RNA therapeutics going forward. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Catherine, and all of our speakers today. Um, we now have a segment where we have a, a short while for a discussion amongst uh, panelists. And uh, while our audience out there is maybe still getting ready to formulate their questions in the Q&A box. Um, so, uh, Ross, Melissa, Catherine, maybe you have uh, comments to, that you want to make to each other to get the discussion going? Sure, I'd, I'd really like to... Um commend Catherine for her talk because I think you pointed out a lot of uh, really important issues around that. And um, in terms of, uh, and it was remarkable to me that the numbers that I cited for how, how long it takes a new medicine and how, how much it costs for the same, essentially the same numbers as yours. Um, you know, one of the things about nucleic acid medicines, and I'm not, so now I'm not just talking about mRNA medicines, but I'm talking about antisense, oligos, uh, um, siRNAs, um, and ultimately it will be uh, gene editing, but um, is that they are, it is truly different because, and I'll just start with mRNA to start with. Uh, once you've, you've found a messenger RNA that works for a particular disorder, then the, first of all, the manufacturing equipment needed is quite diminutive. So at Moderna, we're building out manufacturing facilities all over the world, and I know other companies are as well. Um, but it, there, it, I hope that as, just as, you know, as, as we make more and more of these things and the cost that drives the cost down, that eventually, mm. um, we, you know, even small, uh, communities will be able to, uh, be able to make messenger RNA medicines. And then you can, 
uh, send just the sequence of the messenger RNA to local communities to make their medicines um, and be able to distribute it uh, 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 locally. And so instead of having, it's more of a distributed system instead of a, uh, a centralized system, which is then concentrated in uh, uh, you know, just the rich uh, communities. And mm -hmm. so I, I think it's, it is very much gonna democratize medicine. Um, mm -hmm. And and make make a huge, uh, very big sea change in both how quickly we can make medicines and the uh, egalitarian uh, aspects of it. Mm. Melissa, yeah. perhaps, perhaps you could just comment. Um, I guess there's going to be a reasonable challenge for say some of the rare diseases where you have to deliver the protein to a specific site in the body, right? Mm. Um, well, for, for the rare diseases, I didn't have time in this talk, but for rare diseases you have to deliver the messenger RNA to the particular cell types. So for a lot of the rare diseases uh, that we're currently targeting, these the target tissue is the liver, so hepatocytes. And so we have different lipid nanoparticles for getting the mRNA uh, there. You do, I mean, the difference with rare diseases is you do have to give a higher dose than you do with a vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it's um, it's all very doable. And so it's just, a, you know, once you know how to do it, and there's um, many, many, now that mRNA medicines have been are a proven modality, there are many, many, uh, both companies and academics uh, and other people entering the field too. And so I think the technologies will get better and better over time. Um, and so, and, and by getting better and better, it's also gonna get less and less expensive. Yeah. So maybe I just insert here a question from the audience from Yin Yan Yap to Melissa. Um, how how do you see the potential of treating uh, inborn errors of immunity? Um, hi, Yin Jan. Um, I'm laughing because I got that same question when I was in uh, Japan yesterday. Um, <laughs> so um, so inborn it's like primary immune deficiency. If you have a loss of function mutation then um, you could use messenger RNA if you can get into the hematopoietic stem cells or the, uh, the, the precursor cells to whichever uh, cell type in the hematopoietic system um, that you need in order to treat that disease, you could use that. And there are uh, rapidly, we and other companies are developing um, delivery systems to get into those cells. Now, ultimately, um, for those patients and for ultimately for rare disease patients, I think we all want a cure, right? Um, and that will come in the form of gene editing, gene writing, uh, gene therapy. But those those uh, modalities are just not quite ready yet. And so what I think mRNA can offer in the meantime is we can really start treating those patients now and, and while they're waiting for the uh, um, gene therapy or, or gene gene editing. So, um, but I have seen um, data that are coming from uh, a number of gene editing companies that are, they're going to be delivering the gene editors via mRNA. So the gene editors are proteins, so you need to make them by mRNA. And um, the dream is to get, uh, especially for things like for um, sickle cell anemia, uh, is to be able to deliver that to the hematopoietic stem cells in vivo so that you could have a one-shot uh, cure for something like uh, sickle cell anemia, which if affects so many people around the world, particularly in uh, low-resource settings. Um, and uh, it's coming. I, I think it in the next decade, it'll be here. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um... Maybe uh, one follow-up question to the uh, uh, point about regulatory changes. What what is actually happening there, uh, and or and how should we think about this for the future? But simplified regulatory approval of mRNA drugs. I'm sorry. Could you, I was reading another question. Could you ask that question ah, again? Okay. <laughs> Of, um, about the uh, the processes for regulatory approval, how should they change to really facilitate this progress without uh, uh, making it a dangerous um, yeah. endeavor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think, I think it's really the 
key thing about regulatory and also it's really important that all uh, organizations involved in making these nucleic acid medicines, um, you know, we don't want to have safety issues and failures because of safety because that can set back the whole field. Uh, just one such uh, major safety issue. Uh, and that I'll, the, ex the example I'll give was in gene therapy where there was a, an incident in the um, 1990s that or maybe it was it was the 1990s that set back that whole field for uh, years. Um, so it's inherent that we all should uh, be very careful and and for safety. And um, but that said, the COVID um, pandemic has really changed the um, the regulatory process. And so in order for us to be able to get that vaccine uh, so done, I mean, out to the public so quickly, we had to overlap clinical trials. And that's something that hadn't really been done before. Uh, and then the ability, the um, willingness of the regulators to work with the companies that were developing the vaccines and really uh, be much more of a synergistic relationship instead of, a, 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 you know, we talk to them and they come back to us six months later. Uh, that's really changed. But I think the a big thing, and this is what I was touching on before, is with nucleic acid medicines, once you figure out how to get them to where they need to go, that's uh, the delivery mechanism, then, uh, and that usually is where you have the, the dose limiting toxicities and the uh, side effects are usually from the delivery system. They're a class effect. Um, once you've solved that and you know that effect for that particular class, then you can easily make a new medicine with, um, by just changing the mRNA sequence. So already for our vaccines, uh, the FDA does not require us anymore to do um, uh, toxicity uh, analysis for every new vaccine because all of our vaccines are built on the same platform. And so that will speed up the, the regulatory process. And we've already seen that yesterday in Japan, they um, approved uh, the vaccine, our new vaccine for uh, a var some variants that are circulating in Japan. And the data for that was not based on uh, human clinical trial data, it was based on uh, uh, animal data, so preclinical data, uh, because people are gaining, the regulatory authorities are gaining confidence that now we understand we have correlates of protection, um, so we don't have to go through the full clinical trial process every time. And so it's just, I think it's going to speed up uh, quite rapidly. The other thing about mRNA medicines, and this is also true of siRNAs and ASOs, again, they're temporary. So if they do start causing side effects, you can just stop taking them. Um, and so that that's a real advantage over um, uh, medicines that where you're changing the genome. I guess it'll be different, I guess, for the uh, rare diseases because I guess, sure, the delivery mechanism can be approved, but the protein you're effectively trying to uh, change the expression of um, will differ depending on the disease. And of course, if yeah. you're trying to uh, fix up a, a, a defect in, say, DNA damage repair, and you lead to overexpression of that protein, then you could cause DNA damage. So I guess there'll also need to be a couple of levels of regulation, one at the generic delivery and then one at probably looking at what are you delivering and what's the safety profile, I guess. Sure. And that's the, the purpose of, you know, phase one and phase two clinical trials is to figure out what is the efficacious dose, right? So you you tend to start at a very low dose and keep dosing up. Um, yeah, we haven't really thought about uh, delivering uh, proteins yet that that affect DNA damage, although that's a that's an interesting uh, possibility. Um, so All right. we we tend to stay away from the DNA. <laughs> Um, I think we should switch over to our questions and relate more to Ross's talk. Um, so, for example, I have here questions from Bruce Stillman from Childhood Bilehearts and Dong Chao uh, relating to how your drugs work. Do they work in P53 minus tumors? Um, do they affect uh, or regulate pathways beyond ribosome biogenesis? Um, where does the selectivity to only cancer cells, cancer cells come from? All good questions. Uh, yeah, the drugs do work very well on P53 minus tumors, and that's because 
the nuclear oil, the stress pathway isn't just regulation of B53. Um, the, the slide I put up was admittedly quite quick, but the ribosome or proteins also bind to other regulatory elements of things such as P21 to turn on P21 and then cause cells to senesce or stop dividing, a reduction in MIC expression through various mechanisms, uh, turning off E2F. So there are multiple other pathways which are at play, and, and even in the P53 minus, these are still uh, often uh, active. Uh, so yeah, we can uh, treat cells in vivo or tumors in vivo, which are P53 null. In fact, the efficacy of the drug in um, solid tumors does not correlate with P53 uh, levels. The other question was, how do we get selectivity? Well, I guess that is a key question which we've been trying to find because that also then leads you to how can you stratify patients, which is the number one question that doctors have. Um, Clearly, it's through the mutations themselves. It's not a panacea. It doesn't treat everything. An example would be the work that Luke Furick did where he showed that MIC-driven prostate cancer is exquisitely sensitive to the drug. But if you knock out P10, another model for, for prostate cancer, it does not treat that disease. Clearly, the MIC is causing uh, significant stress on the cells such that when we uh, knock out the ribosome, uh, knock out RNA transcription, they really just collapse in a heap. So I think it's part of it is the tumor cells are really right on the edge of being able to maintain themselves and they're highly sensitive to these perturbations, but clearly um, mutations in pathways can give selectivity, such as I described at the end, these ATRX and H3.3 mutations, which gives selectivity because they specifically affect their ribosomal repeats. But we've got a long way to go to determine how we can select patients sufficiently. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I have another question for you, Ross, from Damien Purcell. Um, how did you capture and protect your IP to fit into your long time timeline of drug development? Uh, with difficulty. Um, <laughs> we had a period there where we couldn't publish in the second generation drug. None of that data I've shown you today has been published. And so we've had five years of um, not publishing any data to protect the IP. And so I didn't show a structure of that drug because we'll show that structure in the first publication, which we're writing up at the moment. So you do have to be prepared sometimes to um, hold on to your work uh, and not present it. And that can pose a significant difficulty if that's the only thing you're doing in the lab. And it's, you have to be very careful about who you put on the projects. Not, generally, it's not suitable for, for students because they need to demonstrate, publish their work and show it. And so most of it's been done through postdocs, but I've just made sure that they've had other projects to work on in addition to this. But it is, particularly for the, the long development time for small molecules, a considerable problem. Thanks. Okay, I have a question to Melissa from Trada. Um, can you speak about the switch from academia to being a sci chief scientific officer? What's the biggest difference? Uh, should we in academia be doing anything differently or training our students to do things differently to adapt to such a change? Yeah, sorry. Um, yes, there's, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, <laughs> so the biggest difference in switching from academia to CSO is I don't have to write grants anymore. Hooray. Uh, <laughs> somebody else raises the money, so I just get to spend it. Um, the other difference is that in academics, uh, you are working with uh, people who are training to be scientists. And so your main job is to help uh, those students and postdocs learn how to do science and do it rigorously. Um, and the, because the goal is learning, it takes longer uh, because, you know, you need to make, let people learn and, and make mistakes. Um, in industry, you're working with professional scientists and they uh, mostly are their subject matter experts and they can just move really quickly. So the uh, pace at, of industry research is actually quite rapid. Um, but a big difference between academics and industry is that in academics for, again, for training purposes, each student or postdoc really needs to have their own project to work on, uh, to, to be the primary person driving, to, to learn how to do science and then to be able to demonstrate that they have, at the end of the day, uh, accomplished uh, and, and have the skill sets needed to 
uh, get their PhD or, or move on to the next thing. In industry, the entire company is as a goal or goals, and everybody in the company has to work toward the same goal. And so what is so crucial is teamwork. And so industry, we do not want prima donnas. We do not want people who are lone actors. What we look for are team players. And one of the things that I say to students, uh, because there seems to be this impression that you, you know, obviously you want to have your single, your first author paper or your co first author papers. But one of the things we look for in on resumes is do people have mid author papers? So where they're the middle author, because that says they're team players, that they don't always have to be first. And so don't discount your middle author papers. They're really important. Um, and so doing team science is just uh, very crucial for industry. Um, the other thing I think that, and I had no idea when I went into industry, the, the variety of jobs that are available in industry to uh, people of dependent on their interests and their, um, you know, what their strengths are. Uh, and that still has been very, um, you know, obtuse, I think, to if you, you can't really see through the window until you're inside. And so one of the things that um, I'm working on now with the uh, Mass Bio, which is our association in, in Massachusetts that of a hundred and, no, it's uh, 1600 biotech companies. It's crazy how many we have. Um, is we are working on an interactive career map for the pharma and biotechnology space that shows, will show um, all of the different kinds of jobs that are available in the biotech uh, pharma space, uh, and then uh, different career paths that you can, can take or that people have taken. Uh, and then also what are the requirements for entry? What, what are the entry points? And what are the, you know, do you need a um, high school diploma? Do you need a, co a college diploma? Do you need a PhD? And then, you know, how do you get that? And so I think that's going to be really empowering. Uh, we hope to have that done by the end of the year, and that'll be available on the web for anybody. And it'll um, really, I think, be very helpful to see. Um, because, you know, most of us, we have, we all have our relative strengths and our relative areas of challenge, right? And so the best thing would be to get into a job that plays to your strengths and where you don't have to bang your head against the wall uh, if and, and if you're trying to do something that just doesn't come naturally to you. The great thing about industry is that there are so many niche jobs that there is a job that is really, you know, sort of perfect for anybody depending on what your, your interests and uh, what you, you know, what comes naturally to you. So, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'll open up the mic, so to speak, uh, again to all the panelists for uh, additional remarks. So I just find a question for Melissa. Um, how do you work with universities and fun, you know, a lot of the fundamental research comes out of the university, which is then adopted. What sort of programs do you have to work with uh, universities? Ah, I'm so glad you asked. And I am uh, going to pull up a another slide deck here. Um, we um, at Moderna have have had longstanding collaborations with a lot of uh, universities, particularly around our rare diseases, because in order to develop uh, medicines for rare diseases, um, I'm just gonna. Sorry, I'm going to share that that's okay. Because um, I do want to talk about this mRNA access program that we have. So this is a talk that I just gave at um, University of Tokyo two days ago. I'm currently in uh, Busan, Korea. Um, the uh, Let me just get to the point I want to talk about. Anyway, so we, we've had to... Um, uh, collaborate with universities for our rare diseases because um, you need animal models and most of those animal models are with academics. And so we, we have longstanding collaborations. We also have longstanding collaborations on, uh, on uh, vaccines. So one of the reasons that we could move so quickly with the coronavirus was that we 
um, had been working for several years prior to that with folks at NIH who worked on coronaviruses and had uh, knew what were what was the right um, uh, mutations to put into the spike protein, to put it in a pre-fusion confirmation to get the best neutralizing antibodies. And so that was all in the bag that had been work done with on MERS um, that we could immediately apply to SARS-CoV-2. And so we have uh, collaborations both with academics and with, uh, with uh, government agencies. But one of the things that, that we like to point out is we really need to do better. Um, there are over 225 viruses that infect humans, but we only, we have very few vaccines. And so there is no way for us to, at Moderna, to, to do this. Um, so we need um, to pull other people in. So we have started a program called mRNA Access, and this is essentially our gift to the world. Um, we uh, feel that um, we have developed this technology to, to easily make mRNAs and formulated mRNAs, for, particularly for vaccines. Um, that uh, we then want to give academics access to this. So um, we already are, um, you can see the University of Queensland is already on our, our collaboration list. Um, the academics who apply to this program will get access to our mRNA design studio, uh, to our production facilities, and we will be able to uh, get within, I think within five weeks is our target uh, to get formulated RNA to them to try um, new designs for uh, new antigen designs for new vaccines. And so I would, um, then this is the website, I would uh, encourage uh, anybody who is interested in this. Uh, and if you also don't remember the website, if you just type mRNA access Moderna, it comes right up in Google. Um, that we, um, really want to, to work with academics. And the great thing about this program is we are not requiring any, there are no strings attached. There is no, uh, it's only a materials transfer agreement. There's no um, licensing that's required. There's, um, we're not, we don't want your IP. Um, we basically hope that if we provide these materials to academics and they, the academic lab finds something that looks like it's going to be a good uh, antigen design, that as a trusted partner, perhaps they would come to us to help develop that with them, but it's not a requirement because we just think it's our moral obligation to uh, do something about uh, the lack of vaccines across the world. And of course, many of these, um, these infectious agents only affect very specific populations. And so they're going to be very specific to that country, for example. That's fantastic. Is there a cost or something that, I mean, how do you triage out the people you're going to work with? It must be yes, of course, we, we triage them. So it not, you just can't like order it from a catalog. That's not it. So you have to talk to the folks at mRNA access and um, it, uh, there has, you know, there's a back and forth. I think I'm not really involved in the application process, so I don't know if there's a formal like um, little, it wouldn't be a very long grant to fill out, but I do think it's, we do wanna be working with uh, labs that are, um, you know, the, the top labs studying various things. And so, and obviously we, we don't have infinite supplies of materials. So we wanna make sure we're giving it to people who we think have the best likelihood of developing uh, new antigen designs. And are you extending it to rare diseases or just just to... we will eventually the the thing about vaccines, the amount of material that you need is much less than for treatment of rare diseases. And so because vaccines have the biggest impact on public health and mm -hmm. uh, Moderna's um, uh, ethos has always been to uh, go after un critical unmet uh, needs. We, we think we're going to start with vaccines and see how that goes, but uh, eventually we will go to uh, rare diseases. The other thing is that as we're building out these manufacturing facilities all over the world, and of course, um, Australia is, is one of the, the places where we're building this, there will be excess capacity at times. Like if you, you know, if we have um, manufacturing facilities for making lots of vaccines, when there's not an epidemic or pandemic going on or in the low season, why not use that excess capacity to make materials for academic researchers to further the research? Um, and so uh, that's, that's uh, some of the thinking behind this. 
Uh, terrific. I had another right. question for both of you just briefly about um, is TGA in Australia up to, up to being very rapid in responding to these new types of uh, mRNA treatments and uh, do they have the right people in TGA to actually analyse and make decisions on this or is this going to be a, a learning progress process? So I can't answer that because I don't have any experience with TGA at all. So maybe Catherine can comment. I, I, can, I can give a brief response, Ross, um, not in terms of the second part about people, but I think, I think what we would need is some fairly significant transformation of Australia's innovation um, systems um, and the T including the regulatory kind of capacities of the TGA, I think. Um, having the kind of that model that's been developed uh, through the COVID vaccination um, regulatory process, for instance, that kind of um, where exceptions were made in the regulatory process, using that as a model for really normalising that kind of rapid transformation will really require a lot of um, change in how we do innovation and regulation in Australia, I think. Yeah, thanks. All right, I just saw a question pop up in the Q&A box, which um, reflects the importance of agriculture as an industrial sector here in Australia. And uh, Trada asks, do we think that this mRNA technology will become cheap enough to take it into animals, for example, against swine flu, vaccination against swine flu? You know, I think with any technology, um, and I, I think about the car industry, right? At the very first beginning, automobiles were very expensive. Um, and But then once they became industrialized, they became less and less expensive. And the same is true of cell phones and all kinds of things. And so as we make more and more of these and, and really hone the manufacturing technologies, the price goes down. And so I've, I see no reason why um, you wouldn't be able to use mRNA vaccines for animals. Uh, it's just not been the focus of Moderna, particularly. Right. I think there's an ARC center of excellence in that, Thomas. <laughs> okay, good. Um, I think we are nearing the end of our allocated time already slightly over. So I think it's probably time for me to conclude and hang, hand over back to uh, Sarada. Great. Uh... What a wonderful session that was. So um, I really want to extend a big thanks to Melissa, Ross, Catherine, and of course, Thomas for the great talks and a very engaging discussion session. Uh, and thanks to our audience for joining us today and participating with some very interesting questions. Um, a recording of today's event will be available on Life Science Across the Globe, uh, our website and also on um, Janelia's YouTube channel in the next couple of days. Uh, and of course, we'd love to hear from you to see how we're doing. So please take a moment, complete the survey that is linked uh, to in the chat box. Uh, well, this was the last event of 2022. So please keep an eye uh, on our website and also uh, register for the mailing list to hear more about uh, the events uh, planned for 2023. 